All righty. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I hope it's all clear to everybody. Uh, Keith and I have done webinars a few times together. And so as, as noted, we are happy to get questions throughout uh, the course of this. I know sometimes you wait until the end and answer things, but um, we are happy to get questions along the way. Um, we're going to give a little bit of a presentation up front, but we're going to get deep into, you know, we're going to have some fingers on keyboard and show you uh, a demo here as well um, on this on this topic. Now, this is something that is very near and dear to my heart. I'm, uh, I have been kind of uh, in the Kubernetes community for a while, and and I'm, I'm a real advocate of of all things that are happening in our community across lots of different ways. Um, but in particular, um, you know, running workloads in Kubernetes that that use data uh, and that use state and and these sort of things. But more importantly, in this context, how do you do that uh, globally dispersed? You know, how do you you know, are you running multiple clusters and then you're doing asynchronous data replication between it? Like there's a lot of challenges I think that we have. Um, and it really comes down to, you know, I, I think of that as federated applications. Um, you know, the SIG Fed group in, in the Kubernetes community has had some fits and starts, but it's always because there's like some really difficult things to solve. And I, and I hope what we present here today is, is valuable to everybody and can help give some context into some of the challenges that 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 are faced when we when we do get geographically distributed um, in our in our Kubernetes deployments and, and and how do you run our applications? So we are going to use CockroachDB as an example of of how we're solving for this problem. Well, that's what we do. We are a database that was kind of designed for this world, but um, but and that's what we're going to talk about. And sorry for not capitalizing Kubernetes here, you guys. I'm so sorry. I, I apologize to the entire community. Um, but by, by by means of introduction, Keith, do you want to give a quick introduction of your experience in the in the community and kind of where you come from? Yeah, absolutely. But before I do that, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a little bit of um, of crud here because you didn't tell me I had to be polite on this call. Oh, they, well, Keith, at the top of the call, they're like, "You got to be really polite and nice to people." You know, that's not what I do, Jim. Why did it, you, you do it all the time? Invite me to that. I love you. So, um, Keith McClellan. Um, so. I uh, have been in the, the greater uh, cloud native space for, what, seven years now. I started my, my career in containers at Mesosphere. So, you know, kind of a precursor to Kubernetes. Um, I, have, uh, I have been kind of leading our Kubernetes efforts here at Cockroach Labs now for a little over two years. Um, what the thing that kind of brought me to Cockroach Labs was one of the, the things that's hardest to do in a cloud native ecosystem is managed state, right? So that's kind of why, why I joined the company, right? It's, mm -hmm. this is a really hard thing to do. And CockroachDB, quite frankly, is the easiest database I've found to run regardless of where you're running it, which makes it perfect for running in Kubernetes. Yeah, in pods on Kubernetes and yeah. And, and likewise, and, and Keith, you, I, I go to Keith all the time with some really deeper technical questions. So y'all feel free to ask whatever you want of Keith. Uh, we, we can go to lots of different levels. Um, I, I originally got introduced to Kubernetes. I was at a company called CoreOS and I, I, I too saw the problem with some of the state, like I was, I'm an ex developer, the application needs a database. How, how does that work? Right. And so that's how I got introduced to Cockroach and um, I'm happy to be here now. It's an, it's an interesting in thing. So let me give a little quick introduction, five, 10 minutes on, a, on some slides, and we'll get right into demo. Um, you know, Cockroach, and, and I think what Keith and I both saw was this is something that was architected for the cloud, um, but ultimately, I believe it was architected for Kubernetes. You know, Cockroach is direct descendant of Google Cloud Spanner. Um, it was actually the Google Cloud Spanner white paper, which was the um, kind of the, 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 like how we got started here. Um, three Google engineers, uh, Spencer, Peter and Ben, our three founders, actually started this company to try to build um, Spanner, but not tied to, to, to Google infrastructure. Uh, how do you build an open source version of that? And so that's really the, the, the foundation of where we started, but this is a relational database and all the beauty that you get with the relation database with familiar SQL, with consistent you know, isolation, a strict, strict serializable isolation. Um, but more importantly, this isn't a docu model, document model underneath where you're kind of uh, accelerating complexity when you start to change things or the more model, the, the more documents they have, the, the more difficult. Let's use the, the simplicity and the elegance of, of a relational database, at, but make that distributed. And that's really what Cockroach delivers, but we implement, we are implemented as a series of nodes. You can imagine each one of these running in a pod, spin up a new node pointed at the cluster, and it just takes care of rebalancing and dealing with kind of where data lives in that cluster. We'll show you that. 
We could scale further. We could scale across regions. And when you start to scale across regions, this is where Kubernetes starts to have some problems, right? Are you going to have, can, can you run one Kubernetes cluster across multiple regions in the clouds? That's difficult to do. Uh, and federating a single control plane across all of that, that's some tough stuff. Lots of companies out there trying to figure that out right now. And I think it's interesting. Um, but for us, we just federate at the data layer. We just create one single logical database across, you know, all the different regions. And we're going to show you that um, in Cockroach. But again, being able to do that, it's not simple. You actually have to deal with the speed of light it becomes a big issue. And what we are going to show you today, not only can we do that across regions, one single logical database, well, we could actually deploy a single logical database, ask any node for the data that's going to access the data wherever it lives across three different cloud providers. And I and, and you're going to see a diagram of what we're going to do, but we can do that as well, which you know, there's a lot of questions. There's just such a thing as a multi-cloud application. We have a multi-cloud database, like one single logical database. Any endpoint in Cockroach can service reads and writes. But Cockroach in the name really comes from our, our resilient nature. Um, you know, depending on what you want to survive from an HA point of view, what, whatever your failure domain, is it, is it a node? Is it a rack? Is it a server? Is it a rack? Is it a data center? Is it a region? Is it a cluster? Um, and so there's a lot of stuff that we do within Cockroach that allows you to survive the failure of a node uh, without service disruption. What we're doing is we're ultimately writing data in triplicate across multiple different nodes. And then we use Wrath, just sim very similar to the way that etcd works in, in Kubernetes. In fact, we contribute to upstream, uh, to upstream etcd and a lot of the stuff that we've done is actually uh, under the cover is actually helping Kubernetes. Uh, a lot of the things that we've found um, uh, to fix an etcd. So if you look at raft or etcd slash raft, there's lots of innovation that we've done there. And, and that's a lot of the area we, we contribute. This is a, our code base I like to think of as a, a PhD in distributed systems. There are some really interesting things that we've solved for as we've kind of battled the speed of light. What's really interesting, I think, when you start to think about multiple different clusters um, and, and the way that Cockroach works, because we are a series of different nodes, uh, you can simply set up a cluster and it's, it's one single logical database. Any node can service a read or a write. Uh, and that's really important because each node is, is the same binary. In fact, if you wanted to bring up our management UI, our DB console, which Keith is going to show you, you could point that at any cluster. And God, man, Keith, I hope you don't kill the node that you're actually doing it on later. But that's it. Yeah, you're going to get into that, dude. We, we've, we had some fun building this demo. I think you're going to love this demo. Um, but our UI is actually serviced from any one of these. You can uh, literally, so like it's, it's, it's kind of a core distributed principle of what we do. We can ask for data, but find it anywhere within that cluster. So I can ask a node that's in US West, but if that data lives over in Europe or US East or whatever, it could find that, right? Um, but we locate data. We allow organizations and, and customers to pinpoint or pin data to a particular location so that we can beat the speed of light. Um, so that we can actually locate data closest to users. Now, people love this for other reasons, like can I comply with data privacy regulations to say all German data lives on German servers, that sort of thing. And so there's some really unique capabilities in Cockroach, but it's very well aligned with the distributed nature of Kubernetes. And in fact, built within the same core principles, the same way that pods work, the way that we survive, the way that we can scale, uh, very, very similar. In fact, the same kind of, you know, etcd and, and raft type stuff, right? And so um, some core principles at, at the base of what we're doing, very, very similar to, to, uh, to Kubernetes. So that's a quick intro. It's actually an important intro because it's actually going to allow us to explain some principles that are going on in Kubernetes underneath when we get to kind of the networking stuff and everything else. So Keith, you want to walk through, um, you know, disaster and, and set up the demo a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So when we start moving to the cloud native, actually, leave, let's stay on that previous slide for, for a couple of Oh, minutes. sorry, buddy. I, I was going to the QA and I, I got lost. Sorry. No, that's okay. So um, so when we start moving to, to cloud native disaster recovery, the we need to treat a different class of events as if they're an everyday experience. So when we are managing our own data centers, um, the, the most common type of failure domain that you're managing for is rack failure, where you have, you know, you'll have a switch at the top of your rack, that switch might fail, that'll take out all of the, uh, the communications to any of the servers that are in that rack. 
So generally speaking, you want to make sure that you spread your applications across multiple racks so that you're not, so that a single rack failure doesn't bring down all your infrastructure, right? Um, as we move to the cloud, we've had to start treating either availability zones or regions as kind of the failure domain, depending on what we need to be able to survive. Um, and that means that we need to automatically heal from that type of a failure, because as soon as a human has to be involved in, a in an event, then that's what basically the, what makes it a disaster, right? Um, because humans are disasters and um, computers are highly available, right? So, so when we when we start talking about this, we want to make sure that detecting a failure is autonomous, that um, that the healing process is is automatic, um, that we don't lose any data, um, that if we do have a service disruption, that's RTO recovery time objective, that it's measured in seconds, not in minutes or hours, right? Um, we want to, and we wanna make sure that the people that are tasked with fixing the problem are, are the people that are also tasked with um, building the solution to the problem. So in a lot of cases in traditional DR where you have two sites, um, the application team effectively created the problem, but the solution Yep. is really on the storage team because the storage team is then restoring back from backups and tape drives or, you know, offsite storage or, or whatnot. Um, so instead, what we want to do is we want to be able to detect a failure and continue to operate. And we're going to demonstrate how a one of the various ways we could do that here today. I, I think what's interesting here, Keith, too, by the way, I love the, the process owner where do we think about these things? And it's actually extending up the stack from storage all the way up into the application layer. And I think we architect for disaster and we are, we architect for DR now pretty much at every layer, right? Like I think there was another version of this. We were talking about it from a security point of view and certificates. I mean, there's lots of different ways or points yeah. where you, you want to think about DR in a cloud native world, right? Yeah. And so, um, what you really need to do is you need to change your perspective on how you think about DR. So, um, so legacy thinking on this is, um, is designing for failure, right? Right. This thing has failed. I need to get it back up and running. How do I do that? What we're doing is we're designing for survival. We are saying, we know this thing is going to fail. How do we make sure we continue to operate even when that happens? And that ch slight change in perspective informs an enormous number of design decisions right. around how you build your system and where you invest your time and energy. And what the, the, the side effect is that it ends up actually being less expensive to design to survive than it does to design to fail. Because for when you design to fail, I've got to have a complete cold standby of everything. So I have to buy two times my infrastructure right. um, just to be able to recover because I don't know you know, there could be a fire in my data center, right? That's the a type of disaster I might need to survive or recover from. If I'm designing to survive, what I'm actually doing is I'm, in our case, we're splitting across three data centers. We're going to jump to this here in a second. Um, if I need, if I lose a data center, I just need to be able to continue to service all of my requests with two of the, the uh, with my two remaining data centers. So instead of having two times my infrastructure, I really only have 1.5x my infrastructure right. to be able to survive a data right. center failure. So I can actually bring my, my costs down by being more distributed and using a database like CockroachDB to enable that. And, um, then, and then avoid all the, the manual labor costs of manual remediation of an event. I mean, that's it's not even active, the labor active cost. system. It's not even the labor costs, it's the mistakes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so when I was setting this thing up this morning, because this demo's... Um, Got a lot of moving parts, which is why we're we're going to show the we're going to show the um, the Julia Child's uh, uh, finally final baked piece and not the. No, oh, I, the, I like the to think about it as one of those setup. fishing shows where they have a scuba diver down there underneath the water and they put oh, like a fish oh, on the hook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's very on. much, it's very <laughs> much like that. Um, you know, when you're designing when you're designing to survive these things. Um, there, there's just a lot of stuff that can go wrong. So when I was yeah. setting up this cluster this morning, I put in the commands in the wrong order 
and I had to blow everything away and get started again. And that's the kind of thing that happens when you have traditional DR. Yeah. A human runs the wrong restore command or a human does like most disasters are human created. They aren't actually infrastructure created. Like I think, I don't remember what the exact statistics are, but it's like seven out of 10 disasters were caused by a person doing something they should have either uh, not been able to do, or um, even if they should have been able to do, they should have been double checked before they were able to do it. Right. They're Those like are the types of things that cause disasters. Generally. Or they're like me, they fat fingered it. You know what I mean? Like it, it's exactly. horrible. Like, everything, anything go wrong and always does. Right. So, so <clears> designing <throat> to survive when someone does something stupid, um, like we all do on a pretty regular basis is, is really the most important thing. Um, so um, if you want to jump to the next slide. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just, it's just a really point. It's funny, Keith, I often, what's the trade-off of, you know, and how different is availability from disaster recovery? I think in the new world, the modern world, we, we design for things to be available and optimize for that. And disaster becomes something you don't, you don't, you don't react to. It's actually, you design it into the system almost. Right. And so I, it's, it's interesting. So. Yeah. So, so here's a picture of what we didn't do. I didn't set up three cockroach DB clusters in three different sites and then kind of try to set up some asynchronous replication across them because I might lose data. There wouldn't be globally consistent. Um, this is, this is actually really hard architecture to manage because and this, is, I, this is typically what people do though. Right. I mean, and you know, with cockroach cockroach TV, cluster with, with, with uh, instance of Postgres or, you know, like what we, yeah. you know, insert database. Right. If you were to do the, <clears throat> try to span multiple sites with a traditional database, what you would do is you'd have instances of the database in multiple locations. You'd have some sort of synchronization process. Right. You'd also have some sort of a sharding process um, to be able to kind of make this stuff um, distributed, at least partially. Um, right. It'd be really painful. It'd probably break a lot unless you had some really smart engineers who basically built a distributed database for you. Um, but if we move to the next slide, I'm going to start showing. But even if you're doing this and you're distributed in a single environment, you're still not solving the problem of latencies at scale across multiple clusters, right? And I think that's, and you're still managing three clusters, but you're managing three databases as well, which operational nightmare. So, right. And well, and the, the reality is, is your failure domain there is a pod or, exactly. or a node, right? Yeah. Um, and so, um, so what we did was um, we created a single logical cluster across three different cloud providers. Um, we're, we're using the different Kubernetes distributions in each of them, actually. So we've got EKS in Amazon, GKE in Google, and AKS in Azure, um, mainly because those were the ones that were convenient for me to spin up. Um, I think you know, Jim, I'm a big OpenShift fan. I would have loved to have made one of these uh, an OpenShift region. And now that Rosa is uh, is publicly available, I think I'm going to add a fourth region to this demo, but I didn't get a chance to do it this week. Um, under the covers, we had a couple of network peering options that we could have selected. I think folks, have, if, if anyone that's on the call is, has been on one of our previous webinars, you've seen us do this with something called uh, Submariner, which does an IPsec tunnel across the sites. Um, it's probably what I recommend for for most production deployments today, it's a pretty performance solution. Um, uh, but to, to kind of highlight a, a different way of doing this, I chose to use something called Scupper. So Scupper is another uh, open source project. It creates something called a VAN or a virtual application network. Effectively, we're doing TP, TCP over HTTP. So, um, so Scupper creates these kind of TLS tunnels between each of the sites and, um, and then uses that to encapsulate the TCP um, packets that uh, would normally be transported between our nodes. So our nodes talk over, over gRPC, right? So, so all the gRPC traffic is then going over these scupper tunnels to, so that we can get uh, communication between all of the nodes. So Keith, this is like solving, I, I think when we think about federated clusters, one of the biggest issues is networking, right? Because you have different networks and that, that's what you're solving here. The other is security, right? And so I know we didn't do this in this demo, but you have solved for that as well in the past as well, right? 
Yeah. So in this case, we're um, I am pre-sharing um, TLS certificates. Sure. Um, one of the great things about um, another open source technology called Vault from HashiCorp um, is it also uses etcd um, and yep. or uses the same kind of underlying protocol as etcd. It uses Raft. Um, so you could um, we could have just as easily set up Scupper and set up Vault and had a single um, certificate authority. Right. sign our certificates um right. that that's something that we'll probably add to this demo over time um yeah we have shown it at, to your point before you, with submariner um submariner is a little bit more sensitive to having that as a requirement than scupper is scupper lets you pretty easily inject like a self-signed sure. ca which is what sure. i did for this demo um whereas um uh, submariner Sorry, is buddy. is going to do its own um it's going to reach out to cert manager and actually request certificates, yeah. which is the right Wait, way to do things. Only, Scupper hasn't got that feature yet. That's yeah. All. The only, the only reason I wanted to highlight it to you, we talk about, you know, designing for disaster um, and actually thinking through and, and, and it's, it's part of the overall architecture. It's, it, there's so many different layers to think about federating of clusters is not simple. You're still going to have to manage three clusters here, but what are the things that you can do in a distributed system to do it across multiple? And I think that's a, you know, and I think the, the networking thing, we're getting closer to solving this at scale with, with lots of different solutions here, but we're talking about networking and three different cloud providers here. So I, I don't want to underestimate the magic of what's going on in this, in this diagram. Like that's pretty phenomenal, dude. So. Yeah. And, and we're peering all three of these networks across three different cloud providers where the infrastructure for the cloud providers doesn't provide any capability. That's right. Doing that, right. They don't so want to, by the they way. They really don't want yeah. to. Yeah. 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 And so like, yeah, like you talk about multi-cloud uh, or even hybrid, like if you want to run OpenShift on-prem and you do it, that's just a multi-cloud problem in my opinion, multi-hybrid, it's, it's multiple, it, it, multiple regions. You're going to have this problem. Right. So yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it's, it's uh, this can, this is happening. Is it easy to do this Keith? I mean, um, I set this up, this, this demo up this morning, so it's mm -hmm. not that hard. Right. Um, the, it's, I wouldn't say it's easy. I think Scupper is probably currently the easiest way to do this. Um, right. I think Submariner is a bit more robust, but it's a little bit more difficult. Although there's some big changes that have come to that project yeah. in the last month that make it a lot easier to install yeah. and working with uh, one of the guys on the team over there to, to update our Submariner demo to use the new install pattern, which I think might get it closer to this. Um, what I really like about um, Scupper is that because it's over TLS, it's over HTTP, I don't have to do any kind of, um, I don't have to, to get the network team involved and right. get uh, firewall rule set and whatnot. Um, the downside is that it's um, it's got more overhead because yeah. we're wrapping all of our TCP packets yeah. in HTTP, yeah. right? So um, so it it's better for environments like this where we want to kind of try something out and see how it goes. Okay. Um, whereas Submarine is probably what I would use today if I needed to do this for a production workload. Yeah. Um, what what's really cool though is both projects are making huge leaps forward um, in a very, in a real rapid way. Um, I, I've already been, I've been interacting with the Scupper team over the last few weeks when I was trying, like, when we started talking about this demo, what, three weeks ago, Jim? Yeah. They already put two bug fixes into Scupper for me to make sure that this demo was was working for us. They've been right. phenomenal. Uh, yeah. I have every confidence that this is yeah. going to be every bit the production grade solution that um, Submariner is going to be. And it's going to have the advantage of, um, being more, uh, being more flexible in its deployment yeah. pattern than Submariner. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't, I also think Submariner is probably going to end up being the most more performance solution. Well, and I think, you know, look at there's trade-offs for whatever and simplicity or speed or whatever, you know, overhead, like I think, you know, there's different, and this is the beauty of this community. I think there's different approaches that are emerging and I think the right approach for each implementation is going to win for that implementation. And so, I just, I'm, I'm just excited that you were like, Keith, I, I know how hard you work and this, this, the, the concepts are here to actually do this. You just need to go out and find them and do it. And that's the yeah. funny thing. And that's, what's interesting about this community, but let, let's move on. Let's get out of slides, dude. So let's talk about what we're going to do here in the demo.
Yeah, so if you move to the next slide for me. Um, so we're running something called TPCC, which is a workload. Um, it's a, it's a um, standards-based benchmark, tpc.org. Feel free to go read about it. It simulates a warehouse workload. We're going to be running not that big of a, a load because I'm going to be doing some kind of uh, neat Just stuff. 100, what, you're like just 150 warehouses, right? Yeah, like we're running 50 one. warehouses per yeah. site. Um, and that, that uh, workload client is just kind of, um, you know, generating some load against the cluster. Yeah. And then we're going to use something kind of neat called- well, One second before you do that. Yeah. By the way, the TPCC workload, we actually package that in the binary with Cockroach, ah, a little commercial. Uh, yeah. We package a, a couple different workloads within the binary that if you wanted to start using Cockroach, Cockroach demo, uh, you can actually run a TPCC workload against our, our, our database today. But yeah, and we um, test Cockroach DB up to 140,000 workloads. So mm -hmm. that's what three, roughly three, orders, four orders of magnitude, um, larger than what I'm doing today. I was, um, this is just kind of a, this is more of a functional demo than, than it was meant to be a performance demo. Um, and then we're doing something called, using something called Kube Doom, which is literally what it sounds like. It's Doom, like from id Software 1997's Doom, that's, um, they yes. released it as a, as a GPL project. Um, and someone um, hacked it to do chaos testing on Kubernetes pods. So yes. we're going to be um, killing some roach demons um, in in um, in Kubedoom, and it's going to kill pods in our AKS region. Um, so a couple of and which is kind of fun, and we're going to show that the database keeps running. Um, it may end up killing the workload generator in the east because um, uh, it is a non- the monsters don't appear differently based on what the pod is. Right? That's right. So I might, I might accidentally- A pod's a pod. A, a monster might, is a monster. I might shoot the TPCC demon. <laughs> um, it actually is not uh, thread safe either. So it might, I might kill um, Kube Doom itself, which could be fun. So it's a little bit uh, meta um, using- uh, doomed to kill its own process. Yeah, but, um, but Keith, I mean, the, the trick here is like, even if you were to kill that, Kubernetes is going to survive that pod. The pod's going to come back, right? Like, they yeah, I just have to, I'll have to reconnect. Exactly. With, uh, but, and the trick here is, and you may actually kill the 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 admin UI that we were hitting. Or, or maybe you're doing it from another region. No, the admin but the, UI. But the point is, is like, once a pod dies, you're killing it. it we're, we're, we're killing the pod, not the instance of Cockroach. We're killing the pod. Kubernetes automatically is going to restart that pod and Cockroach is going to start in that. And the database is not going to have any sort of. Well, the impact, database will right? continue. I mean, the database will continue to run right. regardless of how long it takes for those pods to recover. Exactly. Um, the UI, I think I'm actually reading the UI out of the Google um, region. Oh, good. So you won't kill it this time because we had a couple of fun. Yeah. So I, know. we shouldn't. Although I, I know I am using a load balancer. Um, so one of the other things to keep in mind, this is, this is a specific to Scupper. So a van uses forward proxies. Um, so when, when I pull up the screen, um, each region can see all of the pods for all three of these regions. And so um, in the East region, it's going to see the central and west pods. Those are actually proxy containers. They're just, all they're doing is um, acting as kind of a transport layer for the for the, the nodes to communicate with each other. Um, we could end up killing a bunch of those too. So um, why don't we go ahead and if you could stop sharing your screen, I will start sharing mine. Okay, buddy, we'll hold go, on, let me. We'll go kill some stuff. I love this. So I also already used some cheat codes so that I can actually kill some demons. There's something like 40 pods running in this environment. So, um, so there's a, there are a number of... Hey, Keith, real quickly, there was a quick question there. I mean, one of these regions could have been on bare metal, right? I mean, it's, there's no, I mean, whatever. Like, yeah. the regions are regions, the clouds a cloud, uh, hybrid environments, it could have been, it could have been Equinox metal. We just chose these three because that's what we had. It's good fun uh, to watch. We right? chose these three because I had accounts. Yeah, to that's spin right. Spin up infrastructure for these yep. three. I could have eas We could have just as easily done this in DigitalOcean yep. or done this on bare metal if I had under you know, under, your, under your desk. Yeah, my, I think we probably 
would not have wanted to run it on my laptop, but we could have Fair. technically. I mean, I, Fair. I tested kube doom on my laptop. It did work. Um, so, um, Left-hand side of my screen, the first three boxes, the red, um, green, and blue boxes, those are just the workload generator running in the background. Um, so we're processing transactions. I kicked this off about 45 minutes ago. So we've been processing transactions for a little while. Um, the black area of the console screen is showing you the, the current status of the pods in East. So this is in Azure. So you can see the, the cockroach DB dash east dash zero through eight pods are those are the actual local nodes that I'm going to potentially be killing. There's also uh, the internal proxies. These are the outbound proxies for uh, for the cockroach DB pods that are local. And then we have the inbound proxies, which are marked as central and west. Okay. There are also a couple of other things going on here. We have a client container. Um, which um, is um, the, what's actually run in TPCC. We have the service router um, and we have the service controller. Um, the only thing pod you're not seeing because this is showing the Cockroach DB namespace is the kubedoom pod, um, which is running in the kubedoom namespace. Um, so I didn't switch to that. So um, you can see we're running um, 500 queries per second. I didn't optimize the performance of the queries here at all. So ignore the P99 latencies. Um, if you've watched any of the demos that Jim and I have done in the past, you know, I can get these latencies for TPCC down to, you know, 100-ish milliseconds for our P99. Um, have just didn't choose to do that uh, for this particular demo. Um, I did make sure that we could dig into um, each of the regions and take a look at each of the nodes. So you can see all of the nodes that I'm going to potentially be killing um, are all running some queries. Okay, so I've run queries running across all of the nodes in the cluster. Um, all right, so now for the fun stuff. Um, gonna go over to Doom. I'm gonna make sure that I, I can still can you fire. See through walls? I've got no clipping set up so you can see the names of all the cockroach db pods i'm going to go and kill some stuff i should still be kind of immune for a little bit oh wow keith really bloody pod killing yeah bloody pod killing <laughs> you're going to start to see some of the pods see on the left hand side one of the east proxies died and restarted yep. We got all kinds of stuff is dying. Oh, I ran and then out of, Kubernetes ran is out just bring, And then you're terminating and Kubernetes is just bringing them back. Meanwhile, the database is not having any sort of impact. Now I'm shooting them with shotguns so they're dying faster. Because before I was using the Gatling thing, I can switch to the, the one that like will probably kill me too, the, the um, BFG. Finally killed the Kube Doom pod. Well, so we just saw a bunch of stuff die. And you can see and we're still creating containers. Um, we killed the TPCC process that was local, but my queries are still running um, on the West and in the central. You see three nodes actually still haven't recovered yet. They're recovering for us. Um, we don't have any unavailable ranges, which means we're continuing to process data as we go. Um, and now that this suspect node uh, list is down to zero, our under-replicated ranges will go back to so, zero and the cluster will be completely healthy. So Keith, one of the things that we didn't kind of describe to the audience, I, it, it, in Cockroach, when we write data to a cluster, we're actually writing data in triplicate. So, you know, the replica set is, you know, these three things that are running. So while you're doing that, Keith, I'll, um, so we're writing data in triplicate. We're writing across multiple different nodes, physical servers in that so that we can survive that. So an under replicated range just means that one of the replicas of that raft group is missing. Um, and so the database just knows that and it's just telling us, oh, wait, you're missing, you're missing some data here. Um, what's interesting is that at no moment in time was there an unavailable range, a range you think of as like a tablet or a shard. We automate all of that underneath the covers. So the data, no matter where it was being accessed in West, East, or in Central, was accessible. 
Um, and that's the critical thing here. We, we didn't have any impact to uh, the availability of that data, right? And, but, but we did have, because we killed some pods, that stuff went away. Now, when the pods came back, we're just using stateful sets um, to actually bring that pod back to its current state, right? Reconnected to the storage it was using. Somebody was asking, you know, what's the best practice for, you know, deploying cockroach? Is it, you know, well, how does that storage work? Well, each node is actually has its own storage connected to it, its own PV claim, right? And so ultimately stateful sets is managing that in Kubernetes. And as you kill the pod, it just comes back. Uh, and then the range is back, that that little piece of data, right, Keith? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yep. So. So did you want to show uh, the impact on the some of the metrics, Keith, or no? Yeah. Um so I am waiting for the cluster to decide that it can get its metrics. Oh, right. And I will reshare. This is, you know, what'd you kill? What did, did you, you killed Cube Doom. I killed Cube Doom. I killed the TPCC container. I think I killed <laughs> all of the forward proxies in East as well as um, most of the database pods at least once. Um, right. It looks like I don't have anything left. I have... Look, so for East, I killed half of the database pods. So anything that's here that says 4H, those-, those You're didn't no longer killed. sharing, by the way, Keith. Did you know or- Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, there we so, go. Yeah. Sorry. So um, for anything here that says 4H um, is um, didn't die. Yeah, because we're running for four hours. Right. right. So, um, yeah. But the ones that said there, so we killed uh, a bunch of the forward proxies, um, both inbound and outbound. We killed, it looks like three or four of the Cockroach DB pods. Um, and um, I managed to not kill the scupper router or the scupper service oh, controller, which is good, which is good because that would have killed all of the proxies. Um, that definitely would have taken, the, that's effectively like taking the entire region out of service. Um, the database but, will survive but, but that let me, too. Let me, ask you, but, let me ask you about that, Keith. If you had done that, I mean, it would it would have basically, I think we did this last time we ran this, right? Like it, it would resolve over time, correct? Yeah. I mean, it would just basically automate and heal, correct? That is correct. Yeah. Now, the challenge that we're having right now is I, I think I was wrong. I think I actually killed the pod that was hosting the admin. Oh, so you got to go to a different pod. Yeah. So you have a different IP. So again, what Keith can do is just point our point the browser at a different node that's running. Because I didn't um, set up a load uh, global load balance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, it would have been. All right. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you're back. Let's see. Yep. There we go. Yeah. So you can see we definitely had an impact to our queries per second while this was going on, which is not surprising. We did just take out a third of the cluster, basically. Um, but the database stayed available. It was always processing queries. And it's um, it's starting to recover right now. It, it won't, because one of the load generators um, died, um, the, it won't get back to full unless I restart that load generator. Um, right. But you aren't going to kill the load generator in real life because that's a bunch of people hitting your app. Well, yeah, normally yeah. that would have a load balancer in front of it, so it would have right. um, it would have continued um, anyway. Um, you know, our latency numbers um, kind of jumped around a little bit, which is not surprising. But the I point is, is that the cluster survived right. and healed itself. Right. And, and I really didn't have to do much anything other than talk to you for a couple of minutes. And this is one of those things where it's like, you know, we've, we've talked to customers and they're like, well, we didn't even know an event happened until we went back in time. And because stuff just basically survives, right? And I think that's the, that's the trick here. It's like, you know, you got to actually go find when you have issues. Our biggest challenge is um, when customers want us to show failure in Kubernetes, it's kind of the reason why I wanted to build the demo. It's actually hard to do without like straight up deleting the stateful sets because Kubernetes will regenerate the pods so fast that we don't even have like a substantial service average. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, Keith, gonna, I love your demo. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah. Um, I, do, I do like doing chaos testing with, with Doom. It brings me back to my video gaming heyday, so. Yeah.
It's always fun. Keith, there were a couple of questions in chat. And if anybody has any questions of anything we went through, I'll, I'll go through a couple of them. I think Jim answered a lot. Thank you, Jim, for answering these. Um, but somebody was actually asking about um, a, a project. I think they were asking about Submariner. It's just Submariner IO, right? Isn't that the Submariner website? Submariner.io. Yeah. And then Scupper is Scupper.io? Uh, yeah. S K U P P E R. That's right. IO. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So if you're looking for that, um, I think those are the two projects. Um, uh let's see here jim jim there was one question i didn't do a very good job answering about uh u limits in in docker and kubernetes and kind of how we how we deal with that and keith, keith are you familiar with u limits and whatnot yeah so yeah. um we don't run into a lot of problems with u limits um generally um that's this is definitely a, like a low level kubernetes thing um when using the managed service providers, Kubernetes, we don't have a whole lot of problems with this stuff. Sometimes we run into it with, um, um, with self-managed. Um, generally speaking, you fix them outside of Kubernetes um, and then restart the, the kubelet on the, on the pod host and, that, and then that gets inherited. Um, but that's, yeah. yeah, that's not something that we normally need to even really worry about. We do have some instructions on what to set those U limits to in our, in our docs to support the database because we do have minimum requirements there. Right, right. So um, another question that came through, and this is a real basic kind of cockroach question, Keith, how are pods distributed across nodes? Since stateful sets are used, does this mean it's restricted to one pod, one node? What happens if we want to score horizontally scale? Kind of a softball of a question. Yeah, so by default, we do use any affinities to stop multiple cockroach DB pods from launching on the same physical server, right. largely because we need to treat the server as a fault domain as well. And that's if so, right. um, so now in a multi-region deployment like this, that's less important because we're treating our top level fault domain. So from a replication perspective, the top level fault domain is the, the region or the cloud. So um, we're already not going to have multiple replicas on the same physical server um, by default anyway. Um, but um, you can enable um, running multiple Cockroach DB pods. Uh, generally speaking, you're, you're going to get better performance um, in that scenario if you run larger co individual Cockroach DB pods and then um, scale out by having more pod hosts. Um, yeah. That, that's that's generally the best practice. It, it can be done. You can disable the affinities, but then you have to be very careful about how you set the locality flag so that we don't um, we don't uh, put multiple replicas of the same data on the same physical node. And I, and Keith, I mean that's a pattern to think of, regardless of cockroach. Like you know, like I think that's just something that as you're building your own applications and services and you're running on Kubernetes, like that is a, that's really good advice because I think it's one of those things that you don't know until it hurts you. Yeah, for a stateless application, running five copies of the same no service on a node is not a big deal at all. But for right. stateful applications, um, generally that's not a best practice. That's not to say that there aren't scenarios where we might suggest it for, that's right. for certain requirements. But um, in, that, in those scenarios, we have to, we have to, so, we didn't cover a whole lot of Cockroach DB architecture stuff today, but when an, a node or a pod joins the cluster, it announces its location and it's in the topology, right? Right. So um, in a scenario where I'm going to delete all of the anti-affinities um, from our stateful set config, um, I need to add the node, um, like the, the host name of the pod host as, um, as kind of a, uh, part of the hierarchy for the locality so that I can, so that the database knows not to put multiple replicas in on the same physical hardware. That would be the right. only thing that would have to be done there. Yeah. Um, but performance is generally going to be better if you just use larger Cockroach DB pods in that scenario. Okay. Well, cool. I think we actually hit all of the questions. I mean, Jim, I'm sorry, Jim too. I got to call you Jim too live, buddy. Um, yeah. You know, thank you for jumping in. I'd love I that we, we should, had the I voice. I think we should call him the hatch. The the voice of the voice of Jim came in there for a second. It was great. <laughs> Jim, did we hit every I think we hit everything, yeah. Um the few few questions left, but um I think we I think we 
address most of them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, is if there are any other questions out there? We're happy to talk through. Um, I think this this your code, the repo, it, it's all available, right? Keith, you, you've published all this to to GitHub. Um, there, yes. Um, although the not quite yet, because my notes are still it's in GitHub, but it's not public yet. But we'll get it out there in the next week or two. Oh, and there was a question. There's a question about scaling down CockroachDB that I do would like to oh, answer. I missed it. I'm sorry, buddy. Yeah, it's brand new. Um, so someone was asking about scaling down and seeing it as failing nodes. And is there a way to do it gracefully? Yes, we have a node decommissioning process. Right. So um, it is, um, um, this is a pattern that is a little bit more challenging to do in um, using our current config. We are working on, um, on an operator um, because effectively that's a that's a like a day two operation, not a day one operation. So the stateful set config is great, but the day one ops um, that will that will handle gracefully scaling down your cluster uh, in a way that's not going to create data unavailability. Um, the the other option is to just do one node at a time and make sure that that underreplicated range um, count is at zero before continuing to shrink your cluster. Um, that's a bit yep. more of kind of a hard yeah. muscle way of doing it, but um, but we'll survive that as well. You got to be careful. You can't just take out. You this know, is true with any stateful service. Any any any. I mean, that, again, this is a a truth for all things deployed in Kubernetes. You go kill half the thing, you're going to have some problems. Um, yeah. So so we need to have a quorum of um, of the replicas for each of the ranges available for us to be able to answer queries against those ranges, right? right. So so if we have a uh, quorum, if we're if we have a, um, a raft group of three replicas, um, we need to have two of those replicas available to be right. able to respond to queries. So um, <clears throat> that's why we would only recommend scaling down one at a time. So if, you, if all of your tables were at a replication factor of five, you could scale down two at a time. And at seven, you could scale down three at a time. Um, it's just, that's just kind of the nature of, of um, right. consensus-based replication. Um, That'd be true for any stateful application running Kubernetes, not just CockroachDB. So Keith, let, let's shift the topic a little bit. And, and there's a couple of questions that are coming in kind of re related to something. And this is a day two operations thing is what we're talking about here. How do we scale down and these sort of things? And, you know, um, we get we get asked about operators fairly often. Yep. Um, and I know you do a lot of work on that. What's the current state of our operator for Cockroach? I mean, because like, honestly, Cockroach didn't need an operator to do any of this stuff that we were showing today. It's like literally kind of aligned perfectly with this whole like the kubernetes architecture but we do have an operator so what is our operator kind of delivering then yeah so our operator is making it um easy for users to um to do common administrative tasks against the cluster um in a way that's um safe right so all of the, all of the things that the operator is doing you could already do with the existing stateful set, right. um, but uh, it might involve you updating YAML files and mounting file systems and, you know, like, so a rolling upgrade, for example, right? Uh, we have a manual process for doing a rolling upgrade in Kubernetes today. It's pretty straightforward, um, but the operator is going to manage it in a way where, um, where we're going to do things like health check, fully yeah. health check the cluster and not just the pods before rolling um, the next pod. We're also going to do things like make sure that when you upgrade, you're upgrading to a valid version from the upgrade that you're going to, and you didn't skip a feature release. It's right. it, it's not um, it's not that you couldn't already do all this stuff because you couldn't already do all this stuff. We wouldn't be able to build an operator to do it. It's a matter of making it so that um, uh, uh, you can't it's accidentally fat finger a config and then break your cluster. Right, so that's those types of operations that we're working on. I like to think of you as making things more graceful. Well, I I, I see you, the operator, but, you know, the the like the the operations. I I see the operator as a way for getting how to operate CockroachDB on Kubernetes out of my head and into everyone's hands. Exactly. So that's right. the that's the the reason why I've been spending so much time. And by the, the way, that was that that was the original intent with the operator pattern. Um, way back, you know, years ago when it started was how do you take that, the knowledge and expertise out of somebody who's an SRE who is doing these things and create some sort of framework within Kubernetes. It's exactly what it is. So, yeah. 
Um, there was a question on if we're going to support MySQL uh, alongside of Postgres. Like we're wire compatible with Postgres. We've gone a long way to do that. There's no plan immediately to do anything that is like MySQL. Um, you know, we had so, to make a choice. It's a lot of work, by the way. So well, so the other thing is, is that we're serializably isolated. We didn't really talk right. about the database at all. We're serializably isolated, um, which is um, Postgres can run in serializably isolated mode. Exactly. MySQL can't, and so. Um, it would be much harder for us to provide a MySQL compliant um, endpoint because there's no way for us to signal to the client that we're running in serializably isolated mode. Whereas with Postgres, we can do that. Yeah, learned, I learned something new. Thank you, Keith. I love when I learn things new, especially from you, which is all the time. Or never. Or never. I know, listen. you know, 100% of the time I'm making it up 90% of the time, right? I, I don't even know the quote. I can't even start. So, well, that, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, let me go back to the slides. We'll do, we'll, we'll stay on screen here, Keith, or, you know, we can go back to, yeah, this is it. So, where was I? So I, I, I just realized 50, 52 minutes into the webinar that because I'm using the fancy camera, um, people can see that my headphones have messed up my hair for the day, yeah, which I think is awesome. Yeah. yeah you know, the, the problem with a fancy camera is like, I have to shave like, and, and, you know, Anyway, so we are a <laughs> database that was designed with Kubernetes in mind, y'all. I hope we showed that to you today, uh, but it's, you know, I think there's a lot of principles that we've done in, in, in our code base that might be applicable to what you're doing in, in your code base or what you're actually trying to implement. I like to think of Cockroach in our code base is a, a little bit of a, a course in distributed systems and some of the cool things that we have done. Um, Keith talked about, you know, deploying and, and making things a little bit easier to do. Um, we do have a Kubernetes operator that's absolutely available to all. Um, lots of companies using us today uh, to do these sort of things. And Keith, I, you know, what's a percentage of, of deployments that are on Kubernetes that, that you've seen? I mean, you, you work with a lot of customers. Yeah, so we know of the, of the clusters that have telemetry enabled, we know that roughly 40% of them are running on Kubernetes and right. another 30 of them are running in containers, but we don't know for sure right. if they're running Kubernetes. So anywhere between 50 and 70% of Cockroach DB environments are run in Kubernetes today. These are right. long running clusters. So we define a long running cluster as one that's been up for more than seven days. So not, not something you're running on your laptop and shutting down at the end of the night. Um, also hundred percent of our Cockroach cloud right. clusters are running on Kubernetes. So there's a lot of internal dog fooding around our um, our use of Kubernetes. Yeah, and so yeah, so you could spin up, start running Cockroach Cloud today um, off our website. Um, it's all available. Any of this stuff that we went through is available on our website. But I think most importantly, and Keith, oh my God, how do we go an entire session without saying nice things about docs? Um, I can't believe we made it this long. That's because uh, there weren't any there weren't any docs on how to get Cockroach DB running over Scupper. So well, that's to true too. Out. There's this now, but our docs does do a really good job of if you want to like dive into how we do our transactional layer. You know, there's questions around like how we do. It, 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 typically, in our docs, it's there. And if it's not there, you know, we do have a community Slack channel where people are always on and always answering. So, um, if there are any follow up questions or or other stuff, I mean, we're pretty open and transparent about everything that's going on here at Cockroach, and we're we're happy to engage. And um, we would love for anybody to be part of this community um, and to and to to you know tell us what they're doing or if they have any questions about how this stuff works, Kubernetes and database or without. And we're we're happy to engage and you know, proud member of this community. So, um, Keith, thank you as always. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, that was a, it's a wonderful demo and I, I just, I really, really like it. So, um, I hope this was valuable to everybody today. Um, you know, we tried to make it a little entertaining. I love the cube doom thing. So, but this is something I've never seen before. I've never seen an application run across multiple Kubernetes clusters until I saw this demo and, uh, kudos buddy. I'm in, it's super impressive. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So Marisa and uh, Linux foundation, we are done. Thank you very much as well. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for that wonderful presentation, Keith, Jim, and Jim as well. That's Jim um, too. And thank you. Yeah, Jim too. And everybody, <laughs> of course, for uh, participating and joining us here today. As a quick reminder, the recording will be posted to the Linux Foundation's YouTube page. Mm. Should be up by the end of the day today. Okay. Uh, we hope to see you guys back here again for some future webinars. Okay. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.